Okay, guys, so welcome everyone. Um, this uh, webinar has been organized by the Weekly Fasting Group, which is a very big international group of individuals who put an aim uh, to, um, uh, to fast once a week. So we fast as a group once a week for 24 hours. That's the common denominator of this group. And it's a, it's a very big international WhatsApp group. And in between, we invite different interesting speakers about different subjects related to fasting, spirituality, nutrition, and other interesting things that can help our development. And uh, so in case you are watching this video later on on YouTube, you will find my contact details. My name is Arik, I'm the moderator of this group and uh, you, will, you can send me your email, or sorry, you can send me a WhatsApp message with your name and I will happily add you to the group. Okay, guys, so today we have uh, Joe Holman with us. Welcome. Thank you. And Joe um, has been uh, an inspiration for me for a long time. Um, I have been following his channel. And uh, I am really, really happy to have Joe here because uh, for me, Joe has been kind of balancing influence, you know, without any fanaticism this way or that way, kind of very, very balancing force. So, and today we are going to talk about a very interesting subject of one meal a day. So Joe, um, please tell us, could you please introduce yourself because most of the people probably don't know you here, how you found one meal a day philosophy and practice, what it did for you and whatever you wanna share. Awesome, thank you. So happy to be a part of this. Uh, anytime there's an opportunity to be with uh, like-minded people who are serious about self-betterment and um, facing reality as it really is, it's, it's a very good thing. So um, I, since I was a child, I developed um, tendencies toward overeating. And usually I used overeating as a crutch. Uh, I was born in San Antonio, Texas in the early 1970s. So it, it was uh, a time being in the South Texas area, it is a, uh, an area of a lot of Mexican food. So a lot of spicy, really good um, fattening foods. And uh, one of the things that I developed early on is habits of really bad habits of overeating. Back in the days when soda, soda was in a big glass bottle and you got a treat once a week, it's now an every week thing, every day thing for a lot of people. But uh, well, I developed bad habits early on and I would overeat. I would uh, stuff myself. I uh, eventually graduated high school and then college and I carried those bad habits through college. So what started as a 160, 190 pound frame in the early years of my life soon gave way to 230, 240 pounds. Before I knew it, I was well over 300 pounds and uh, had all sorts of health problems. In, uh, in the year 1998, I was on my first blood pressure medication. And that came from eating high fattening foods and uh, gorging. Uh, I uh, had my first foot trouble from uh, my first back trouble from just being very overweight. And as the years passed, things got worse. And I finally uh, ended up going in for uh, having to have a CPAP machine uh, uh, so that I could sleep a little easier. And I never ended up getting one, but the doctor turned to me that day, it was 2003, and said, you're going to have a stroke. You're going to, uh, you're going to have a stroke. There's a picture of stroke. It's got your little, your name up by the side in the, in the Wikipedia, you know, uh, and um, I remember getting very angry with that and thinking, that's stupid. You know, that's not going to happen. And if it did, I wouldn't care. I just, whatever. I just, I live life as it comes out. But the more time went by, I found that um, that was not a very good philosophy. Um, with a three-year-old kiddo, I, uh, I couldn't play with her. And so to summarize everything so that we're not taking too long, uh, in 2013, I was so disappointed with myself, with my eating and with my uh, continued overeating that I, I stood up in front of the TV and I said to myself, I swear before God that I will never be a slave to food again. And that was actually May 31st of 2013. The next day I started one meal a day. And 
And when I started, I had no guidance. I had no instruction. I had no real guidelines on anything. I just decided that I would be in control and I would never allow myself to eat more than once a day again. And I was hopeful that I would be under 300 pounds at some point, or at least that I wouldn't gain weight. But this, that was the very start of the story. And so as to what created this or what started this, it was really uh, a, a, a force of many things. It wasn't any one thing. It was my dissatisfaction with myself. It was my stubbornness. It was my looking in the mirror and hate, hating who I saw. It was the depression. It was the money I spent on uh, spending $45 at a chicken restaurant just for me, uh, going to the local CBS or Walgreens or corner store and ordering bags and bags of candy. I would spend about $20 on candy and I would eat chips and I would eat all these things that I realized would make me sick. And I would get mouth sores. I would get canker sores on the inside of my mouth. I would get, uh, my feet would swell. I would, uh, my blood pressure would go up and, uh, I, it kept happening. And so it was a culmination of all of those things. And I realized in that moment, uh, May 31st, it was the afternoon, late afternoon of 2013. I said, I will never be a slave to food again. And it was an ominously clear moment. And I knew from that point on that things were going to be different. So when the next day rolled around, I had a half a hamburger and maybe a couple of French fries or something, but I had a juice with the meal. And that was all I had that day. And so um, the rest is history, as they say. So. Wow. Wow. So inspiring. So Joe, uh, has your OMAD been the same since then or it uh, got through some kind of an evolution? Always an evolution, always an evolution. And, and I stress to anyone listening, your journey will not necessarily be the same as mine. It might be very different. But uh, when I started, I had, again, had no guidance on what I was going to do or how I was going to do it. I just knew I was going to control myself. I would get rid of sweet sodas. I switched all over to diet sodas and anything else, uh, mineral water. I didn't do mineral water at the time. I did do that uh, Mio type of artificial fake water, fake, uh, fake sweet water. And so when I did that, I realized that the starting point was get rid of the sugars, get rid of the... Uh, anything I wasn't going to make a meal out of. I think on some level, I did appeal to common sense. I said, look, I know that chips and candy are going to make you hungry. You know, you don't want to eat a whole bunch of chips and candy. So I wouldn't do that. But everything else I would eat, if I wanted stew, if I wanted sausage, if I wanted spaghetti, if I wanted pizza, I would do it. Um, to say the least, the food choices that I made from the beginning were pretty bad. Uh, they were, in fact, incredibly bad. And then I realized along the way that when I ate junky foods, I felt worse. And when I ate better foods, I started to slightly feel better. Um, but mostly it was a mental game. And it was a, uh, a situation where I realized I could never, I couldn't fall off because I'd done that so many times. And it was so very difficult and so very hard sometimes, especially the first week. It was so hard that I was constantly looking for things to distract me. I was looking for fights. I was watching MMA. I was watching stuff to make me feel more aggressive so that I wouldn't feel that emptiness in the stomach. But of course, that was just, that was just me trying to overcome my mind, which is all fasting really is. So but if you fast forward to the end of the first month, I was at a turning point. I, uh, two weeks was much easier. And then finally a month, I realized I could keep doing what I'm doing. And so that was the big turning point. By the end of the second month, I wasn't looking back at all. I was a changed person and I was down. I was, it took about, uh, let's say June, July, August, three months to get back under 300 pounds. So I started at 363 pounds. And I dropped in that time, I was back under um, 300 pounds. I got up in the morning, the, sc the scale said uh, 299.8 or something. So I was so excited. And I celebrated that day by going out and getting some Taco Bell with a, a Diet Pepsi. It was my only meal. Um, so as the, um, as the months went on, I began to change still. I began to realize that if I had 
if I combined certain foods that I would have a better time fasting. If I did a high protein day and had eggs and bacon and fatty foods and I left out the carbs, I would absorb it better. And I found out that if I eat rice and, you know, um, noodles and things like that, then I also absorb that better when I do that by itself. So some of this you, you see on the OMAD Revolution channel, my channel where we go into uh, food combining a little bit. Uh, but ultimately what never changes is there's no quick fix. There's no easy way. There's no um, dieting aid. There's nothing like that. There is simply self-control. And when a person becomes, uh, gets involved in the mastery of that, then that's when progress is made. And so um, when I, uh, at the first of the year, after about six months, I brought in fruits, uh, blueberries started to taste good to me blackberries, raspberries, stuff that I never liked, even bananas. I hated bananas. I always hated bananas, but I started loving bananas and I just got done with today's meal and it was, it was a fruit, fruit meal today. But, um, I, I, uh, I, I emphasize that as I grew, I realized that food was less important than food choices were less important than your mind's choice to continue. Let's put it that way your willingness to move onward and to make progress and to not fall back into old habits and patterns, which you know destroy you, is a much better deal than saying, well, I'm looking for a food like cacao or, you know, a sci berry or something that some people don't talk as much about anymore because they go through the cycle of uh, the, the, you know, where the health food industry, which is so popular because it's preying on people's weaknesses and desire to get a fix and to or to remedy a fix so it's really in a way you could say just as bad as junk food in that respect but when i came out the other side uh i emerged as a, a completely different individual uh both by way physically i was i uh, by april of 2014 so just under a year from when i started i was already at 200 pounds so i had gone from 363 to 200 pounds by august I well in the low 180s so i wasn't done yet but i was i was as far as i was concerned i could have stopped there and i would have been fine but i decided to keep going and my family said no 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 more you're too tall you don't want to be too skinny and i gradually started bringing working on exercise which i had done a little bit at a, when i hit about 250 pounds i started bringing in body weight exercises and dumbbells and doing more aggressive walking i think when i got to 220 I brought in a little bit of running, but I, was, I, I wasn't really into it at that time. So the, the, the evolution, though, led me always back to myself. And I found that of all the things people touted, of all the things people said were the best way to go, food types, pills, supplements, um, eating different regimens, eating in the morning versus eating at night and all of this sort of thing, you really can't lay the credit to any one thing. And so... Uh, to bring this question to a close, that's, it's ongoing even still. I still make changes and I still find the same. You always come back with you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. Joe, and um, has it been only OMAD for you all this time? Or sometimes you did jump back to like two or three meals a day? When I was do losing the weight, never. I would never cheat. I would never take in calories. I, uh, I, after the first of 2014, when I was on the journey downward, I did cheat one or two days and I, I enjoyed some alcohol with friends at a party once. Um, you know, I was younger then, but uh, it was, I still, we would go out to the ranch and have a fish fry occasionally. I cheated about probably two days on the second year, uh, but basically, no, I did not. And I knew my tendencies. So I think I cheated one more time because I moved the meal time. So I had effectively two meals that day and went back on it. But I don't consider that really cheating. Um, but I did that as far as now, if the question applies to now, mm -hmm. I generally, I, all, I very seldom don't eat once a day. I, if, if it's a big celebration, I might. Uh, so let's say once a month, I'll cheat right now. Mm -hmm. About once mm -hmm. a month. Good, good. Now, Joe, uh, let's get a little bit into the philosophy of OMAD. Uh, when we have an average person, how do you think OMAD will contribute to them uh, in terms of their 
spiritual development and in terms of their physical development? Well, I really don't think there's a way to fast and be successful and not have a spiritual impact. I believe that very strongly. I believe that uh, whether a person believes in a capital G God or not, it, it's, it's going to come back to the same realization of self versus other. And it's going to come back to the same realization of, the, of, of what the Indians called the Brahman. Uh, it's going to come back to the realization of the ultimate divine self. However, you don't have to call it that. Nobody does. Uh, I've identified as an atheist for quite a long time. Uh, I don't use that term anymore. I use uh, a Taoist or Buddhist as a, a way of identifying because it's more descriptive of how I've evolved. But it doesn't matter the label. And I tell people I am fully Christian and fully atheist. And they get a laugh out of that because meaning I have all the strengths and uh, none of their weaknesses. I'm not tied down to a dogma. I'm not tied down to a, excuse me, I get these notifications that pop up sometimes. Uh, I'm not tied down to any dogma or limited system of thought. And uh, as far as physically, the other side of that question, uh, I believe most, almost all of the population, even if it's only temporary fasting, if it's only on the weekends, if it's only once a month, will benefit greatly. Uh, blood sugar levels, uh, the body's ability to clean out the gut and your intestinal tract, the ability to absorb uh, dead tissues throughout your body, cellular waste. Uh, we've had we've learned about this for a while now. Every culture in the world, going back to the beginning, has used uh, fasting as a way to perfect themselves. And really, it ties right in with common sense. When a bear is sick, the bear goes next to a stream and lies out and just drinks water and they fast. And it may be 10 or 20 or 30 days. I remember a documentary about one that uh, was poisoned by a poacher and the poison didn't quite kill the bear. The bear just fasted about two weeks and then was good as new. And of course, your instinct tells you to quit eating when you're sick with certain sicknesses. But uh, I think it ties right back in. And so when a person is on a quest of self-betterment, regardless of the motive, and they start experimenting with fasting, they're bound to benefit both spiritually and physically. And I don't think there's many exceptions to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got it. Joe, and do you think prolonged fasting is always beneficial for everyone? Because for, for now, we have been talking about like 24 hours, like one meal a day, but mm -hmm. prolonged fasting, will it always be beneficial? Or uh, there are some people whom, to whom you wouldn't recommend this prolonged one? Oh, no. Now, there are people that the one meal a day version may not be the best option. Uh, there are people that are underweight, for instance. There are people with severe anemia or deficiencies that might, or if, if they're really severe, they might need to make other arrangements. I know I'm thinking of two guys right now I work with who are, um, you know, who've been, you know, they're, they're, they've tried for years to put on weight and they've always been underweight. So if they get underweight, you know, and OMAD is so good at getting people underweight that it, it's usually not going to be the best thing for a number of people. However, that's a pretty small number of people. Um, there may be a few medical conditions uh, like type one diabetes or something where a person finds that that's not the best suited for them. However, that doesn't preclude fasting in general. And of course, as you know, there's different forms of fasting. One meal a day being the one I champion, the one I believe is the best, but uh, it's not, a person is not tied to that. And I tell people, uh, I've actually coached clients where if you can only have two meals per day, and you have two meals and one slightly larger, one slightly smaller, and you split them up and get rid of all your snacking, get rid of all your sugar uh, and be smart about it. You can lose weight on that as well, uh, albeit much slower. And it's kind of more one of the ways to get into maintenance is just adding a second meal. So the big thing is don't be tied down to a dogma. Same thing with our, our last question you know, regarding spirituality. Don't be tied down to any one philosophy. Your body will speak to you. Your mind will speak to you. And if you are clear on your intentions and you are honest in what you're setting out to do, then you're not going to be tied down because what was best for me may not be the best for you. I know that it's the best for me, however. Mm, good. So, for example, if a person now comes to you and says, I want to go fasting for like seven days or something like that, five, six, seven days. So, um, which, which criteria would you check first before telling them if it would be recommended for them or if it wouldn't be recommended for them? 
Uh, my approach on that, if I am, especially if I'm coaching anybody, if I'm or considering coaching anybody, or if somebody just sends me emails, I get emails every day like that with exactly what you said. They said, should I go on a two or three or four day water fast before I start? Should I go on a juice fast before I start? My answer is always the same. If you know why you're doing what you're doing, why not just start today? Because what I'm trying to knock at is this desire to master everything. And it's this feeling of wanting to feel high. And you notice this in the self-improvement community where people get excited about being excited. They love these mindsetpreneur podcasts. They love these shows where there's a motivated speaker who's going to tell you how to change your life and all of these sorts of things. That's not the answer. The answer is just get started right now. Just get started right now. And that's what people sometimes don't want to hear. I tell them, if you want to fast two days, that's totally cool. But you don't have to and you don't need to. And it's not going to win you any brownie points. It's not going to give you any cause to, to do any sort of jumping up and down and rejoicing unless you just decide you want to compliment yourself for doing so. I tell people, you know, when someone says to me, oh, well, I'll start tomorrow. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, we'll do it. And I'll be like, why not start today? What, what, what's happening tomorrow that is different than today. And they'll say, well, my, my best friend's coming into town. We were going to go drinking or something. Wait a minute. That's going to happen after you're fasting too. Why would you wait? And of course, the problem becomes they're, they're trying to follow the, they're, they're, they're going with the sizzle, not the steak. They love the experience instead of the reality. And that's what I try to knock away. That's what I try to clear the path for. If you can acknowledge right now is the perfect opportunity, then you have attained the first big step in enlightenment. There's no perfect day. There is no perfect time, just as there's no perfect uh, workplace where people are not going to tempt you bringing coffee and donuts to work and cream and kolaches and all of this good stuff. It doesn't happen that way. So what you do is you say, I'm going to start right now and I'm going to begin my one meal a day journey. I'm not going to vary, even if somebody brings something that's tempting, even if somebody you know, offers this, that, or the other. Uh, so I know that's a broad way to answer your question, but mm -hmm. the really powerful point is to always be focused on not being high. And I know I don't use that phrase, but when you're high about something and you're, you're elated and you got those juices flowing inside you where you're like, yeah, I'm going to do this. That's not the real you. The real you is the one that gets up every morning and sits on the toilet and looks at that strange flower you know, pattern on your wallpaper and says, what's the meaning of it all? Uh, you know, why am I meant to count? What's going on? What am I going to do today? You know that feeling when the sounds aren't ready to hit you, you're early in the morning and you don't want to get up yet? That's the real you because you haven't absorbed all of the dogma from everybody else, all of the advice from everybody else. So listen to the real you and understand that if you're going to start fasting, I say this to anybody, why not today? Why not today? You might not care about your goal that much. You might say, well, it doesn't really matter to me. I can start whenever. Those are the people that don't succeed. And the same thing with these people that do long fast. They tend not to succeed, I hate to say, because they do a big pilgrimage of 10 days and they start to say, well, I've done enough of this. <laughs> so they burn through their reserves, as you were, as it were, and they, they their mental reserves. And then they decide that they're really seeking something else. So when I coach people, that's the one thing I figure out. Are they seeking what I'm offering or are they seeking something else? And if so, what? Mm, wow. So much food for thought. You see, guys, now I'm addressing the audience. You see, guys, we are lucky to have Joe here. Like, you understand. You, you can, you understand what I mean. Now, uh, now Joe, um, also, um, we have lots of people in the group who are into different kinds of uh, food lifestyles. Like we have fruitarians, we have vegans, we have maybe people who follow Ayurvedic um, type of um, diet. It's really an open-minded group. We don't have an agenda. But uh, you are saying that it's not food that heals you. It's not food. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, the impression that I got listening to your videos. It's not food. But then... Uh, but what actually heals you then if not food? Your body. Your body, all you have to do is get out of your way. And that's what fasting allows you to do. It allows you to get out of your own way. You don't know how many health coaches have emailed me and have criticized me to say, hey, why aren't you having them eat greens? And 
uh, you know, and all of this stuff. And uh, I say, I kind of got involved with one. I'm thinking of one example. I said, just, just tell them to, to fast, like I said. And lo and behold, in time, she wrote me an apology, this coach. And she said, I'm sorry, because you were right. Uh, because, you know, what you said allowed them to, she said, I realize now it allowed the body to get out of its own way. So if you're constantly stuffing yourself with food, you can't heal for obvious reasons. But if you're also going on health kicks and you're, you're downing a bunch of high protein, uh, pro pea protein smoothies, and you're downing all of this stuff constantly, and you think you're helping yourself, odds are you're kind of just getting in your own way. Not saying it's, it's always wrong to have a smoothie, but I'm saying I, I had three today. I, I love them. But the point is, if you lose the, the focus on improvement, you lose the game. And you lose the game by thinking that there is a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow of doing one thing. This is why the you remember the wheatgrass movement in the early 2000s. There were people, if you eat wheatgrass, you'll be perfectly healthy. You'll have no autoimmune disorders. You'll have none. Of, and lo and behold, you find that's not true. Because the people that go to these hippie, hippie fests uh, are just as sick and as, uh, you know, have the same problems that anybody else does. But when you look at the consensus of all diet plans, and I mean carnivore, I mean fruitarian, I'm, you know, it, Mediterranean, you break it down how you want it. What you find is all of the researchers in claiming wellness have to take into account, take into account the lifestyle, healthy mindset. Because when people go to improve their health on any diet, they improve. If a person's going to go carnivore and get rid of sugar, they're going to see some improvements. If a person's going to go vegan and get rid of animal fats, they're going to see some improvements. Uh, same thing on down the line. So that's really what they're, they're, they're getting. And when a person goes a certain lifestyle, they start to see the benefits for a while. And then what happens, the pendulum swings and they realize it's not the panacea of excellence that they thought it was because food never has been. If there was, if, if raw goat milk could cure diseases, people would be lined up. Uh, if it could, it could uh, stop, uh, you know, GERD and all of these problems and, uh, you know, uh, raw, you know, cacao and all of this stuff that people keep talking about, that would be the thing. But if, and gr granted, there are regenerative foods. You know, I love watermelon, apples, grapes. Uh, that, that was my meal today. I've made three references to my meal today. Cherries, I love them but I realize they're only valuable in a context, in a human context. They're valuable as I'm able to absorb them. Somebody else may not be in a, in a position where they can benefit as much. So that's what people forget. And that's why I say you can never let food choices be the driving force behind your change. And I've had people who were consulting with me and I would have to fight that because they'd say, well, I, I should do this. I'll go right ahead. But don't think it's going to it's not going to make you lose weight quicker. It's not going to take away all the problems you have. I mean, if, if you go vegan, you're still going to have problems. If you go carnivore, you're still going to have problems. It's not going to cure all the relationship problems, which happen to factor in to why people overeat. You don't know how many coaching sessions I have done with people where people started crying because they realized they were overeating because of their relationship with their mother or their spouse or their abuse when they were like 11. It's crazy the way our demons, demons become a part of us through many things. And what do you do as a human being? You block it out. You say, no, that's not me, I'm good. And then you develop habits that compensate so that when you're 35 or 45, you realize you're a mess. And when you've got a gut and you look at yourself in family photos and you say, God, I, I hate the way I look. What have you done? You've built some karma and you have no idea because you weren't mindful. You didn't really realize it. You got to a point in your life and it finally burst. It's like, um, you know, letting things go until they become immanageable. And we humans do it all the time. So, hey, I spend, I, I tell everybody this, I spend time in every camp. There's days I'll do eggs and bacon. There's days weeks actually, where I've done nothing but fruits and fruit juices. There's, uh, I love rice. You noticed on my channel, I love me some rice. I love Chinese food too, but I'm not married to anyone. I'm not married to a single one. So when the time comes, I'm going to enjoy my rice and I'm going to enjoy my eggs and bacon. And I'm going to enjoy all of the, the glories of watermelon and cherries and all of that sort of stuff. But one of them by itself does is not going to solve the world's problem. So as long as a person has that in mind, 
go to live, live to your heart's desire. Do you like watermelon? Yeah. Have it five days a week. If, if, if you find that it's, it helps you, most people will find that you get to a point and what you thought was a panacea simply is that's mm. the reality. Wow. Wow. Now, Joe, uh, let's say there is a person with a kind of a more, more of the puristic mindset, and then they will think that their thinking will go the way something like, if I now take the diet, the dietary choices, uh, like uh, maybe fruitarian or another person might be, might be living carnivore or in keto or in anything like that. And if I combine it, just that, with one meal a day, then I will multiply the efficiency of that. Now, if I understand correctly your mindset, you would discourage them from doing so. You would discourage them from choosing one particular dietary choice or dietary style and combining with one meal a day. Now, why is it so? Well, uh, it's not necessarily that I would say they couldn't do it. Uh, you can do it. You can have you know, all the fruit you want. Go right ahead uh, if you want to do that. However, you're, the reason I would discourage them is because that strikes against the principle of lessening the priority of your food. What you want to do is eat and be done with it. And if, if you folks look on my channel, you'll find I say that in so many videos, eat and be done with it. You can enjoy your food, you can plan your food, but after that, turn that off. You eat and you're done with it. You're, and that's the same thing that's keeping you in a health mindset, a food purity mindset. It's like going around with white gloves. What happens? You can see every bit of tarnishment on there. Every, you can see every dark spot because it's white. So I call that the purity fallacy. When you try to purify yourself, you're going to uh, end up with the fact that you see more dirt and you end up with more, you're taking in more than you otherwise would. Uh, it's a fact that many uh, vegans have been made sick with smoothies and things because the, what, what they saved on the fat that would have gone around their waist came back in the form of the pesticides from the plants and made them sick. And so you'll hear plenty of stories about sick vegans. And uh, the reason for that is because they don't understand this fallacy largely. You cannot be a purist because ultimately you're going to, and then here's the practical question behind it. Let's say you're a vegan for, for two weeks and then you have a big business trip coming up. Well, now you have to plan the meals. You, you have all of this. You're basically being kept a prisoner of all of that because you can't buy store-bought juice because store-bought juice has been pasteurized. There's no biophotons in that. There's no healing enzymes as, as anybody who's done any juicing knows. You're not going to get much benefit at all from a, a, a store-bought juice. So the real challenge is understanding that you have to not sabotage yourself. And that's why I stress to people, get away from food purity as much as you can. Liking food, knowing food is good for your body. Knowing food is uh, better for you than other food. It's, it's obvious that broccoli is going to be better than Reese's peanut butter cups. But if I start to, if I do more than that, and I say, I'm going to choose this food. If I go any further, then I'm going to end up back in the purity fallacy. And it's like um, uh, uh, if, if you saw the movie, the show, um, Man in the White, uh, Man in the White Castle. Uh, or, what am I thinking of? The Amazon movie, Man in the High Castle. <laughs> uh, the whole movie, I don't know if you guys have seen that, but uh, some of it is, it's, it, what if the Nazis won the war? What if the Nazis won the war and the, we were all speaking German and there was the American Reich and that's what the premise of the film is about. And so ultimately, however, the more purist John Smith, the main character becomes, he becomes a loyal Nazi. He converts from, you know, with the takeover of the American way of life and he converts to Nazism. But then lo and behold, spoilers here, folks, uh, his own son has a genetic weakness. Uh oh, what do you have to do with genetically weak people? You have to exterminate them so uh, because you can only have the pure. You see where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. The problem with purity is that it can't be maintained. And this is why Buddhism was so wise so long ago to point out that dukkha, which means, uh, I hope I'm not jumping your question here. Any of your other questions? No, here, no, but... absolutely not. Absolutely not. Please go on. So dukkha means, basically, it, it's a word that comes from a word that means a crooked wheel. It means that the system is imperfect. And this is why everything in life has, has you suffering from something. Uh, this is why you look down the street in your neighborhood and you find that the couple with a criminal record uh, who are committing crimes have lots of kids. And you notice the nice missionary couple that lives down the other end of the street, they're having to adopt kids because they can't have kids. Uh, 
Uh, dukkha is the reason you look at the world every morning and you turn on the news and you find more horror, more school shootings, more uh, people that are, you know, families that are broken apart by adultery and horrible things. Why do all of these things happen? Why is there murder? Why is there death? Why do children get cancer? All of this is Dukkha, and it's the first of the great noble truths of Buddhism. And it, it's so great that it describes, it basically tells us that if you're going about to perfect the earth or change the earth, you're not very wise because the earth is perfect as it is. And the Tao Te Ching, one of the best and most brilliant documents ever written on this globe, talks about the universe being perfect as it is. You can't change it. You can't make it better. You can sure try, but you can't go too far because once you forget that things are perfect the way they are right now, you lose your mark. And that's why so many people start out doing only peaches or uh, only greens or only carnivore. And then they, they eventually lose their way because they find themselves in a position. They couldn't get the food. And then they, they self-destruct and then they cheat. And what do they do after they cheat? They say, well, I've already cheated. I might as well blow it. And then the next day they do the same out of sheer depression. Pretty soon they're off the path again. So there's no question that there's nutritional value in meat, that there's nutritional value in eggs or fruits. The problem is if you take one of those and you say, this is the, the be all and end all, you basically make it God. And it's a type of idolatry. Let's use the term idolatry. It's a type of worship and it always ends in disaster. And so that's why I say, you already know what foods you like. You know how your body best handles certain foods. If you don't do well with strawberries, get the hell rid of strawberries. But don't sit there and say that a person has to eat a certain way. So I'm not telling anybody you can't eat a certain way, but don't don't get on a pedestal because that that way leads downward down that's a downward spiral. Yeah, yeah, Joe, you're absolutely right, you know, and I must confess that in the past, in my past, I found myself just obsessing about food because when you, when you, once you get into this puristic mindset, it is so, so easy to find yourself thinking all the time about food and what you're going to eat and whether it's pure enough. And you just, you stop living, you stop living. And yeah, and that, that's, that's the message that I like a lot in your videos. You just eat and be done with that. And, and, and start and, and go go on living, yeah. <laughs> That's the hardest thing because it's yeah. easy to it's it's very difficult to forgive someone sometimes. It's very difficult to do the thing you don't want to do. When you're ready to be angry at someone, it feels good to be angry. When you're ready to lose weight, it feels good to try to lose weight. But when you're not, now what do you do? So you have to go back to the mindset that is both ways compatible. Yes, you're going to have days where you're more motivated, where you're ready, and you're going to have days where you're not. But anytime you misplace your, your priority and you, you, you stop focusing right now, you stop saying, why don't I eat right now? There's a can of sardines in there. Why don't I just go and get that? There's a, why isn't that good enough? Why do I have to go out? Because you're following a desire that, is, that you yourself are, are ignoring. And so that's the danger with people. And I see it all the time with people who fail because they start chasing idealism and it's the worst thing everything is perfect the way it is now i tell people don't forget it that's true in every area yeah yeah absolutely okay joe i think we will let uh, we'll allow our, our our audience now to ask questions because from my experience the best framework for those webinars is that the speaker talks for example like 20 minutes or something like that and then, and when, and then we have some questions then we have some other stretch of talking and then another bunch of questions. So is it okay with you? Absolutely. Let's continue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. So if you have any questions for Joe, please unmute yourself and you can just ask directly. We also have a few questions in the chat, but maybe someone wants to ask a question. Okay, then I will just read a question from the chat, and then of course I have a uh, few more questions. So, uh, so there is a question from Lalita: uh, Is there any specific time to take food, or we should have food only when hungry? So that's the question. Oh man, as I have incarnated it here, is 
time restricted feeding perfected. So no, you do not eat when you're hungry. You eat at a particular time when the meal window opens. Uh, my first meal window was 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, and when, if I, I, the reason for the meal window is so that you can move around the time you pick to eat. It's not so that you graze through that time, because if you're just grazing, you're just intermittent fasting. You pick a time and you eat your meal. I generally eat or did eat one plate of food with nothing stacked higher than three inches and nothing falling off the sides. So that gives you an idea that gives you about 1400 calories at the most when you're trying to lose weight. Uh, for most people, that's going to keep a person in weight loss. A person can do less than that and be at a calorie deficit. But as far as the meal time, you never, ever start before the meal window, the eating window opens. And the reason is, if you allow yourself that, what you're going to start doing is you're going to start eating every day. What you're doing is you're sacrificing the fast because you're going to get hungrier sooner and you're going to be right back to where you were. That's the thing that people face. They don't realize it's going to get harder if you actually time restrict and you don't start eating early you're going to realize it's more challenging because your body's going to be forced to uh, start you burning the fat that's on you, but not if you shorten the window. You want to keep make sure that you're eating within the time selected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Joe, and uh, from your experience, is it uh, does it uh, is it important when exactly do you do you have your eating window, uh, such as like in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, or it's a, a completely a matter of choice of a person? It is a complete matter of choice. Do not listen to these people who, uh, who tell you that you can't eat at night. It's not true. You can eat any time. The most ideal time, if I had to pick, would be 11.30ish uh, a.m. to 2. But again, that, there are night shift workers. There are lots of different people. On different, I've done all of them. I, I've eaten in the morning. I've eaten midday. I've eaten late afternoon. And I've eaten at, I've eaten at night. And uh, when I used to be an overnight manager for a hotel, when I started home, that's what I was doing. I, uh, I would eat, um, I would eat overnight. I would eat at 2 a.m. So that was my meal, my noon, uh, so to speak. <laughs> but um, I, you, the important thing is to pick a time and stick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then if something comes up, such as a family event, can it be flexible as long as it, it is one meal a day? Correct, well, which is why there's a time gap. So let's say you can't eat at 11 a.m. one day, you eat it at 1.30 because you got something came up. You have to plan for that because you will have that happen, but mm. you try to put it in the window always. Mm, okay, interesting. Then we have another question for, from Revital. Revital, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, well, my question is about drinking. Is that can you do you have to drink only only during the eating window, or can you drink um, uh, for uh, for the rest of the day? And if yes, is that just about water or vegetable and fruit juices? Uh, good question, but no, it, you can you can drink anything that is non-calorie the rest of the day. So coffee, tea, water, diet sodas, mineral water. Um, I don't recommend stuff like diet sodas, but I started with it and I used it. And I still occasionally have one and they don't taste as good, but anything that is non-calorie, you can have after the meal. During the meal, uh, I would recommend a, something like a, a, a juice with, and if you really want, if, if weight loss is what you're looking for, what you can do is do two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, and it'll also help with digestion of your meal, but you can have a sweet tea. It can be a caloric beverage at the meal just nothing after. So when you're done with your meal, you're gonna transition into no calorie beverages. So water obviously is the best choice of all. And I recommend that the most. So. Um, okay, so you said after the meal, there's no drinking, even not water. No, 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 after, you're, you're good, you're good. You're, you can have non-calorie beverages all throughout the day at any point, just, during the meal, you can also have a caloric beverage. So you can have a, if you like sweet tea with sugar, you can have that at the meal because your, your only insulin rise will be right then. It's, it's not gonna happen again for, the, for, for 23 hours. So it, enjoy water, he, he, always enjoy water, always. Yeah, tea, uh, green tea, black tea, anything. You can have those after the meal as well. What about coconut water, coconut water? I believe that has calories. If you can find some with less than five calories, it's pretty much considered a non-calorie beverage, you're okay. But 
you don't want to be getting any fructose or anything, but even if it's healthy after the fasting window, because that's not true fast. And the whole point, you don't want any, um, you don't want any pancreatic function. You don't want digestive function. Because drinking helps with, uh, when you drink, it helps with the hunger, like your. If you drink it. Yeah, sometimes hot water, drinking hot water is, uh, you can drink uh, ginger water or even garlic water if you have the stomach for it. Um, and those are non-calorie beverages and they have nutrients, good nutrients. But um, it's really best if just water and waters and teas are really the best non-calorie beverages around. Okay, thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. Got this. Okay, uh, now we have another question from Redmi. Uh, uh, so you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Anyway, this person ra is writing, I had very severe constipation when I followed OMAD for a week time. What could be the reason I was on a raw vegan diet then. Okay, so this is very common and, and constipation on one meal a day is common initially, but it goes away. And if you wanna help it go away faster, you can get more liquids. You can also vary your diet. So let's say if you're, you, and you mentioned doing uh, vegetarian, you know, the, raw, vegan raw vegan, raw vegan. Okay, so if you're eating uh, one meal, what you're actually doing is because the food is so liquid, yeah, you're going to have very seldom have bowel movements. I've done it myself and you will have, because most of it, you, it's so hydrating that it, and good for you that it just goes into your body. You have very little waste. Uh, if you're, my recommendation to somebody who's not following raw vegan would be uh, mix it up with animal proteins and electrolyte drinks. There are zero calorie electrolyte drinks that do help. But my advice, if you're going to stay raw vegan and it's working for you, then just prepare because you will, you will generally not have a lot of bowel movements. I've done it and had one every three days. And I realized that after a while, I kind of had to push myself because there wasn't that drive. You'll still lose weight. You lose, you lose weight really good, just like anything else. But that will be a symptom. And if you think about it, especially if you're not getting enough to eat, like if you're really you're getting six, five or 600 calories a day, which a lot of people that try raw vegan on OMAD, they end up filling up so quick because it bypasses a uh, fruit, uh, sugar bypasses the insulin reaction largely and goes right to your liver where it's stored. So you fill up really quick. Uh, if you do that, you're probably getting too few calories. If you get a few more hard foods, like bananas, more solid foods, and you're not doing any juicing, I'm gonna assume that you've been doing some juicing, but uh, maybe you haven't. Um, the fiber will help, but if you're going too much and you, you uh, I don't know your food choices is a lot I don't know, but I would say wait it out and uh, you you will, you, you won't stay that way. But I do know exactly how it is to eat. Constipation for a while is, is common. Okay, so um, a person who asked this question, if you want to unmute yourself and clarify or add anything, you're welcome to do so. And if any of you guys have another other questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask more questions. And if not, I'm, I will continue asking mine. Okay, Joe, so um, let's get back on our course of thought. So uh, now I would love to ask you about transitioning to one meal a day, if a person really wants to do that. Now, obviously you have lots of things coming up, uh, such as uh, food cravings, such as this feeling of emptiness, what to do with myself, etc. Social difficulties and situations. So what would be your main tips of transitioning? My main tip of transitioning is remember the swimming pool. You remember how it is going when it's the first day of summer, it's not maybe it's the water's still cold, you, you're a kid and you, you go and you dip your toe in the water and you say, ah, oh, that's so cold. And occasionally you make the mistake of putting your toe in ever so slowly and you get colder and colder and colder and it's just miserable. But then one day you get the courage to just jump in and you're only cold one second and you're done. So by way of analogy, if you jump right in, you'll do much better. Uh, don't do any fridge cleaning out. Don't do any uh, crazy maneuvers don't make any preparations just 
do an initial weigh-in, find out your weight, agree to weigh once a day, uh, once a week, not uh, once every seven days, that is. Do not weigh every day because that will very often sabotage you because you're going to see all of the little losses that you're going to have. So, and then uh, 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 what, do your first weigh-in, track it, and get going. You don't need to do anything else. Uh, again, right here, right now is the focus. You, you're not anywhere else. You don't need to have the perfect foods. You don't need to have the perfect drinks. And if you find one tomorrow, guess what? Tomorrow's coming along. You can have it tomorrow. But right now, you're not, you're, you've got what you've got. And if you can go with that mindset and you can jump right in, start today. Have you not eaten yet? Start today. If not, start tomorrow. Let's do it. Start tomorrow. No excuses. We do it. Now, if you run into excuses and you say, well, maybe I'm not ready for that, or maybe it's your choice, but ultimately what you're going to find is that's another form of procrastination. And I deal with so many people that say, well, I'm working toward it. What they're actually telling me is they're toying with the idea if they really want that. So they're saying to themselves, that looks really cool to me. And I want to believe that I can do that. But they're saying they're doing all of this other thing over here to try to warm up. But they're, they never quite manage. It's the same thing with self-help books. Most people who read them will never make the changes in them because they, the fact that they're going to a self-help book means that they themselves are putting themselves down and saying the answers are not within there without. The answers are always within. There's no without. And that's the big secret of, of the, the, the quest of wisdom. You're always led back to yourself. And I've said that like, what, four or five times now? So... Uh, I don't have any advice except to say, be honest with yourself and know what you're about to do. Um, you're, the fact that it's going to be hard, anything worth doing is worth doing well, right? So if it's worth doing well, be prepared for it and go in and start tomorrow and say, I will do what I need to do. Uh, yes, it's going to be an adjustment. There's no way I can prepare you, uh, prepare you except to tell you, go to my channel and look at the videos on what to expect at the end of your first three days week, two weeks. Uh, I have all that documented. Yeah, you're going to go through withdraw from, you know, following your cravings. But what you're also going to do is, and what you're not seeing, most people don't see, you're not going to be the same person a month from now. You're going to be a different person a month from now, just a month, not two years, not three years, just a month. You're going to be a person who realizes that all of those cravings, they can't live in a uh, time-restricted environment. If you can only eat once a day, you can't eat when you're bored, eat when you're to take back the power, eat to celebrate, eat when you're stressed. You can't do those are the, what I call the evils of eating. And if you if you can't do those, you can't maintain your attachments. And of course, that's the second of the great noble truths of Buddhism. You Buddha said you suffer because you cling. And that means you hold on to things. And of course, Buddha also said clinging comes from ignorance because you believe the truth is outside of yourself. And so if you don't want to suffer, don't cling. And the only way you won't cling is if you know better. Well, now you know better. So don't cling because clinging is the source of all unhappiness. Thinking that something is outside of you is the source of unhappiness. So right now, right here today, make a decision. I'm going to start eating one meal a day tomorrow, if indeed that's what you want to do. Uh, and then start tomorrow. It doesn't matter what anyone else does. It doesn't matter if your family doesn't approve. It doesn't matter if there's a certain ceremony you have to attend uh, you're going to have to make those sacrifices. I know all too well how it is to sit at a dinner table with uh, a water and maybe a lemon in the water uh, during fasting and telling my friends and family, nope, can't eat today. I'm, uh, I'm fasting. And sometimes they would say, come on, eat, I'm eating. And I'd be like, now nah, you're good, really. And yeah, that happened so many times I couldn't give you a number. If you ask me right now, how many times I couldn't give you a number. But if you're not prepared to do that, you're not going to succeed. If every time someone brings cake to work and you have to break the fast and eat it, you're not going to succeed. Just going to tell you now. So our, the question is, are you going to dip your toe in or are you going to jump in? I say jump. In. Good, good. But then there is another question, you know, when you get, when you um, don't eat throughout the day, just one meal a day, then you have all this time, all this emptiness all this, uh, you know, boredom that you encounter. Now, how, how can you deal with that? What you, is... see what, you see the problem? You see what we, we talked about when we talked about being high, the opposite of being high. Don't be high. The ability, I believe it was Robert Heinlein who said, 
uh, the ability to sit, the, all the world's problems come from the inability to sit in a, in a room alone for five minutes every day. Uh, and that's true, which is essentially what meditation is. And this is why when you look at what meditation really is, it's the ability to listen to your own breath and to realize that the wisdom from that is resplendent, rising and falling, rising and falling. In that moment of just sitting there, of being hungry, of looking around you and looking at your walls and saying, what's the meaning of all of this? This is terrible. I, I can't quit thinking about my food. This is awful. That's now you understand why it's such a great thing. You're going to suffer, but you're also going to have, you also now have clarity. You have the wisdom from the suffering. That's why this, that's why this works. It's because you are paying back the karmic debt that you created when you got overweight. The fact is every, for all of those years you went out and ate, and, and pigged out, you're creating a karmic debt. And that debt you have to pay back. It's just like, uh, you know, I was, uh, I, I can remember being a kid and seeing those candy bars um, and I would eat them. And my mother would say, no, no, don't eat those. But we have to sell those for the little league team. And uh, she would come in there and put change and say, don't eat any more of those. But I never understood, how do they know? How do they know? And she said, because we have to turn in this bag with money, with signatures sh sh stating who the customers were. So we can't cheat them. But I still didn't understand. Then I got older and I understood. That's the way it is with, with life. You can't cheat yourself. You can lie to somebody else. You might get away with it, but you can't cheat yourself because you yourself know. So when you're suffering throughout the day, it's the fact that you think of your craving that allows you to meditate upon it and glean wisdom from it. And I'll give you an example. One of the best ways to fight cravings is just to sit there and listen to your breath and say, craving. It sounds stupid because you already know it's a craving. But when you say it to yourself, you're focused on the fact that you're, dis you're becoming a third party. You're mm -hmm. disconnecting being in the experience and you're focused on the fact that the craving is not you. The craving is a fantasy. It was created as a result of your past decisions. So basically you can kicked off at yourself. You did this to yourself, not anybody else. But by focusing on it, you can identify it. Uh, one of the ways, and this sounds silly because it doesn't sound like what people's, people have in their mind when they talk about meditation. They say, well, if you're driving, you can say driving. Think about the act of driving. And you realize suddenly you're a better driver because your head is in the moment and you're focused on the fact of what you're doing. And now you're also focused or you were you realize you were focused on the fact that you were going too fast because you were mad at your boss or you had to stop and do something else throughout the day. You realize how our minds wander. Mm -hmm. We're constantly Absolutely. poison of 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 doing too many things. And we start to believe that we are this. We're mm -hmm. not this. Mm -hmm. Everything mm -hmm. your body, all, your ego, all of this is a construct. And it's completely irrelevant. It's completely arbitrary. But the one thing is not is the fact that you, the core part of you recognizes self and other. And that's what you call the divine spark or the Tao or the Brahman. It is the truth that is within us all. And we share that. If you could strip away all of our imperfections and all of our weaknesses and all of our you know, idiosyncrasies and the fact that we were born across over the seas, across the pond like you guys are, or right here in the States like I am, it doesn't matter. You're still the same, the same way uh, closed circuit television in one location is the same as one in another. They're seeing different things, but they run into the same system. That's mm -hmm. exactly what our lives are. So as far as fighting off cravings, you, I can tell you to drink water. I can tell you to get diet soda to give you a little sweet taste. I can tell you to keep your beverages close hand, which are good ideas. Ultimately, you're going to have to cross that bridge. And if you don't, something's wrong. That means you're, mm. you're eating too you're not, you're not doing it right. But once you get past those cravings, you realized you can keep doing it and you didn't die. And it's an amazing thing because now guess who's the master? You're back in control. Your food is no longer your master. So you realize that just being in the moment and facing your cravings and saying, we're here, let's bring on the cravings. Let's bring on the depression. Let's bring on the boredom and have the biggest boredom party we can have. Now mm -hmm. it's not, now it's not boring anymore. And now it's not bad. It doesn't mean it'll be fun, but it will become fun because once you get those endorphins flowing after a few days or weeks, you'll get what's called hunger high, where your body is burning ketones and you start processing 
uh, the, the stored fat on your body. And then when you eat your food and you get back into digestion, you go through digestion, your body's back to burning what is on you rather than what you ate. And I tell people on OMAD, what you're really doing is you are eating, uh, you're not eating the fat, the, 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 the food that you eat. You're just taking it in as a placeholder. You're really eating the fat that's on. You're just keeping your digestion moving by doing a daily. So if you go and you eat a tuna fish sandwich or something, don't worry about how big it is or how small it is. Understand that all that's going to do is keep you going so that you, your body can, you can keep functioning in the world. But you're really not eating. You're eating every moment. When you're sitting there and you're hungry and your stomach is growling at night and you just can't pull yourself together, that's when you're eating because your body is forced to use what is stored within your body. And after a while, you won't even know it. Uh, the other day I've done uh, fruit the last several days before that I had some, some sausage or something like that. I don't miss it. I don't go throughout the day going, oh, this is so hard. I don't even think about it until maybe two hours before the meal I get hungry again. I don't even miss, I don't miss a beat. And you can do the same thing. There's nothing about me, folks, that gives me some magical power. You can do exactly the same thing. Wow, wow. Joe, and would you say that um, it also, this transition is, uh, also includes uh, cultivating some other fields of interest other than food so that you can actually pursue something that is really important for, for you rather, rather than being obsessed about food? Um, well, this, this whole process got me into Chinese herbal medicine as well as, well, all of this stuff. Uh, uh, but it's, it's uh, the Chinese medicinal herbs. I have some videos on that. Uh, uh, Hishu Wu and Godu Kola. And they, these things have great value. They are the closest things to superfoods on the, the planet and they're fungus and uh, roots. And uh, so there, there's some learning there. Uh, one of the ways I do, I use coffees and teas to take in I take a series of drops, usually daily, if not every other day, uh, and they're longevity herbs. I'm, I'm hoping they're longevity. I haven't been sick in a very long time, so I think they're working. Um, but uh, that's that's a, a herbalism is a very good a very good field. Of course, mainly what I would suggest is that you, as much as you can, once you know what you want to eat, get away from it and start putting your energy toward your work. Go out and do your therapeutic walk. If you are hungry, go out and do your walk. And lo and behold, you'll find that your brain is going to be like in the shower, like where you get those thoughts that come to you that are just kind of cool. You say to yourself, oh, that's a cool thought. Why didn't I think of that earlier? Because you're relaxed and you can start to go over and, and function in that state. That's why I say empty is a new form. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so cool to realize that you don't need as much food that the American diet, standard American diet and society at large provides. You don't need it. You need very little. Yeah, yeah, no, but actually when I asked this question, I meant that if you, you gave this example of a person who feels completely empty and kind of bored and then they have to observe themselves. Now, that, then that's perfect, but uh, what I meant is that in addition to that, when a person wants to transition to all mad, um, would, would it be a good advice for them to, in order not to find themselves less in those situations of uh, this boredom and emptiness just to cultivate something that really interests them other than food, such as music, such as whatever. Right, well, that's why I mentioned walking and cultivating interests like your career. If, if you have a, you know, go and apply for a job, go and do things. If you're a gardener, if you're a, one of my hobbies is, uh, I have a whole a YouTube channel on flashlights, high intensity uh, uh, flashlights. And I, uh, I do, it's a hobby. Uh, I actually make a little money on the side, which I don't care if I do or not. It's fun. But you do those things out of healthy interests. Uh, if you occupy your mind, what I don't think we should do, we don't want to avoid anything. So we want to face all cravings head on and again, make them the main event. But when I say, we, when you ask a valid question, what can we do when we're starving? Go for a walk, take up your hobby. And remember, that's the hard thing to do because you have to choose to readjust your mind from a state of suffering to a state of productivity. But understand the process, you're building new karma. That's gonna happen whether you want it to or not. And I tell everybody this, if you hate the cold, like a lot of people do, you could get up every morning and take an ice water bath in February in Siberia and you would suffer greatly. But after day 60 of making yourself do that, you would miss it when you didn't do it. Food, this is much easier than that. So. I say, don't 
the, the thing that you can do is focus on everything else besides food, whether that be your career, whether that be your family and taking care of the kids, reading books, bathing them, putting them to bed. Uh, but the reason I can't give a specific answer beyond the, you know, cultivating other interests is because that's what will it take for you to absorb that in your mind? It's different for you than it's different for me. And some people, they're like rabbits, that their mind is just jumping around. They're ch- I did a video on that about why scared communicators can't lose weight because they're always interested in researching some new thing and trying to find out and their mind can't calm down. So you have to quiet the mind in order to do that. And guess what? I can't tell you how to do that because you've got to be able to do it yourself. And so that's why I say, if you're very serious about attaining your goal, find other hobbies, cultivate them, and time will go by very, very much faster than it is. Mm-hmm. I okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, guys, do you have any more questions? Let's see if we have anything in the chat. Totally good. I'm not in a hurry. Yeah. Good. Okay, Joe, now I wanted to ask you about quantities of food that a person eats on OMAD. Because uh, uh, um, I think most of the people here in this particular group, they, they, do, they do not have to lose weight. Uh, but uh, those are people who want to heal themselves, basically, mm-hmm. or to um, cleanse or to just be healthier in general. So um, what about quantities? Like what kind, what, which quantities of food do you have to eat on OMAD in order to succeed? Um, well, I've said this a while, too. Um, 80%, if you can eat to 80%, you are doing good, especially if you're a person here who's on a wisdom quest or a spiritual quest, and you, which I'm assuming is all of us, uh, then you can very easily control yourself to where when you eat, if you feel like you're about 75% full, you're probably pretty good. Uh, when you get up and you feel like you could go and do the laundry and run across the house, you're doing good. Uh, you wouldn't want to run around the block, but you have enough energy to be able to do things. If when you eat that you have to go lay down a while and just lounge on the couch, you've probably eaten too much, mm. uh, depending on a few different variables. But that's a question that if you can get up and be productive right now after you eat, assuming you just got finished with a nice meal, you're ready to go and you don't have to sit down on the couch and say, wow, now i got to let that digest like it's Thanksgiving. No, that you don't want to eat like you like you would eat on a on a splurge day or a holiday, but uh, if you can maintain that, that's going to be your goal. Am I in control when I'm eating? I'm taking that last bite. Number one, am I not craving sugar? And if you're not, you're you're healthy. You should not be craving sugar at the end of a meal. Uh, but if you when you're, am I able to do a task or a chore? Am I able to go, you know, vacuum or do something that I need to do around the house like I was doing this morning? Um, I went for I did a. Uh, a workout with weights this morning as well but um, are you able to focus on your tasks are you able to get back to your tasks after your meal how do you feel those are the gauges um, when whether you're regardless of the reason even if you don't want to lose weight you can do that if you're and if you're struggling with getting calories and, and you're too thin and you're, you're trying to want to do that then eat more on certain other days but remember on the OMAD platform um, it's going to favor heavily those who need to lose weight it just will Mm. it's hard to overeat on one meal one insulin reaction per day it's hard to gain fat Mm -hmm. okay okay joe and i also wanted to ask you what's your attitude towards this idea of detox lots of people in the fruitarian community in raw vegan community they get really really into this detox thing where they are always detox now what's your take on that it's another sell the sizzle not the steak thing it's a very, no, not that it doesn't have any value. It does because you give your body a break. So I'm not going to say it has no value, but you're always detox. You are going to always, your body's going to be doing what it is. So all you have to do is provide an opportunity to allow it to happen. Uh, as far as doing a juice fast, I've done 31 days and uh, I, I did one 15 days. And then the last one I did was 31 days. They are really good and they're good for your mind and your, your, your focus uh, all of those things are great, uh, but they're more uh, inspiration for you. It's like uh, watching a training video and getting inspired or listening to music. <laughs> yeah, I so, did it. Yeah, Joe, so, so basically, so you did this juice cleanse um, within the framework of one meal a day. So you just drank juices one time a day and that's it? 
Correct. I had uh, the big tall mason jars. I did four of those. So I would uh, I would do that. And um, yeah, I loved it. Felt amazing. It wasn't until the last few days my body said, OK, we're, we're kind of ready. I would have moments where I would get really low uh, after a while. But uh, it's definitely true, especially if you can keep it in the one meal a day platform. You certainly don't have to. If you do a true juice uh, cleanse, then you really don't need to worry about the OMAD structure. But uh, if you you can use juices on an OMAD. Uh, yeah, I use, I'll use two of those same jars and maybe a banana when I'm doing uh, like, you know, just when I'm just doing a fruit meal, that's really all you need. You don't have to do juice. You don't have to do, get an expensive juice. You don't have to do any of that. The, the, the plants are so dang healing and cleansing because of the water content and fiber. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna do well just on, go to your blender. You have to have just a blender, maybe a neutral bullet and just put, uh, uh, do what I do. Put in. Um, I do watermelon. I do apples. I do blueberries. I do grapes, and then uh, some cherries. Some of those dark sweet cherries that are pre-pitted that come from uh, pretty much any store. Organic ones. I throw them in there, and it's a big red drink, and it's intense. And I'll I'll uh, I'll just drink it. Who who needs a sweet soda or sweet tea when you can have that? That's the best thing around, and you're getting something that's going to improve your vision, even over the short term. So if you want me to talk up fruit and, and carbs, I will, because because they're de that's always the way I go. Um, I'm, I just I'm not exclusive to that. So sometimes I'm going to have uh, my 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 chicken. You know, I'm going to have other things, too. But uh, I've gone we, I've gone uh, weeks on OMAD with uh, fruits and you will lose weight, I assure you. So um, balance. though. if we're talking complete OMAD, if we're talking about um, getting long-term results, I would eat what is around you. I would follow the cardinal principles. Uh, you, you guys can look up my videos on the cardinal principles of OMAD, and uh, I, I have quite a bit of material on this, as you know. But um, yes, a cleanse does have its value if it's understood properly for what it mm. is. Okay. Okay, guys, do we have any more questions? Hi. Um I was wondering um, how many hours and what time a day, what time during the day is it, uh, um, is it good to do this, this you know, one oh, meal a day? Any time that is best for your schedule. If you're a morning person, you like to eat in the morning, you can do it. Uh, if you're an evening person, you like to eat with friends and family when everybody's off work, then you can do that too. Uh, my personal best time, and this is only me, is 11 a.m. Because your body is coming out of processing what you had the previous day into the next day. So even a late lunch around 2 or 3 p.m. is usually as late as I'll eat because that's when your body is most optimized to have food. You'll find that if you eat in the morning, uh, your body's not turned on yet. Now, the good, the good with that is that you don't eat as much. And uh, the bad is, is that you're going to have a longer row to hoe, but it's still really good because you're going to be able to get back into fasting sooner when you're awake. So you're going you're gonna to start to realize that you're burning body fat again. At first, you're going to feel hungry, and then you're not going to feel hungry. You're going to start feeling uh, really productive. Once you get used to it, you'll, you'll be jumping up and down, especially if you have a, a fruit-heavy diet of raw foods. As a, as a, you know, you don't have to do it every day. If you did a raw fruit, raw food day every other day or every other two days, you'll find that your body will adjust very quickly and you'll feel a lot better when you're in a fasted state. But if you, the time is all up to you. And what about how, how many hours is the window itself? Two, three hours? The window just to, to arrange the schedules is about, I do four, I do four hours because you don't know how, how much, how bad your schedule is. However, you may not even need a window if you never have any challenges on your time or your schedule. And all you do is, okay, you're just, you know, kind of like for homebound people that don't get out. Yeah, they can just eat at a certain time every day, not worry about it. I just give the window for time so that in case you do have to move it, you still have a, a guideline for when you're supposed to eat. Most people do well with some guidelines. So, but do you eat uh, during the whole window or it's just like uh, more or less so just it's a staging way. it's a staging period you're going to pick a time and eat your meal hopefully within one hour in that one so again i try to start mine at 11 but because of my work schedule sometimes it's after one that i get to eat 
So I move it to one and I eat the meal. But when the window is closed after 2 p.m., I'm not eating a thing. And before, I'm not eating a thing. So basically, it's a buffer. It's about one hour. You, you just yep. eat a bit and, and you're done with it and that's it. That's, so that's absolutely. Like, uh, right. So it's not like two hours or three hours. No, correct. That, and that's what people, I try to tell people, don't confuse it with a grazing window because then you're just grazing. That's just intermittent fasting. That's helpful, but it's not as good as one meal a day proper, which is what I'm advocating. Okay, and then the rest of the day is just drinking uh, like water or tea without any calories, just Correct. so you're not hungry. Now you got it. I can tell you got it. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay, guys, do you have any more questions? Hello. Hello there. Uh, so I had two, three questions. Uh, I'm the one who asked the constipation uh, question. Okay. So about about that, I had to ask that you said it will uh, take some time for the body to adjust. So how many days would be needed to like uh, have a normal, a normal, you know, normal bowel movement? How much time would be needed by the body? Well, again, um, I don't. There's a lot of variables I don't know. I don't know how much you're eating. Um, I don't know if you have any medical conditions that might complicate things, as far as constipation goes, if you are, I have found that if you are eating grains, a whole lot of grains, it tends to make it worse. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know your diet, but generally. Yeah, uh, uh, I was on a raw vegan diet and I also plan to do on a raw vegan only. And uh, in future also, if I plan to do OMADS, I would prefer doing raw vegan or fruitarian only. So I'm asking about that. So if you want to do that, I know I would, I think the problem you might be having is adjusting to, to, to having less bowel movements, because that's what you're going to do. If you're getting raw food, you're, you're going to have to kind of, it may be a month. Uh, it okay. may be a month with your body, especially if you've come from eating little meals mm -hmm. and you've eaten, you're eating more, the challenge will be to get enough food. And most people on raw food diets, no one mm -hmm. will disagree with most people on raw food diets are not getting enough to eat. So yes. you do work because at it. And it's not calorie dense. It... Right, exactly. So um, you have to ask, is that the best choice for you? But if you decided that that's the best choice for you, uh, mm -hmm. I enjoy raw food. I eat a lot of raw vegan a lot of the time, but I, I don't call myself that because I'm not committed to it. There's times when I don't. So yes. if you're like that, then I would prepare to, yeah, you will, you will go to the restroom less less often. I mean, that's going to be going to be a fact. But then eventually, after about six, you'll probably your body will figure out what you do. And what about exercises and heavy workouts in the same routine if I want to follow? Okay, if you are you looking to lose weight? Uh, no, I'm quite a healthy weight, but uh, it will not matter to me if I lose some pounds. Oh, okay. I got you. I see what you're saying. Um, then yeah, your exercise is fine. I tell people who are losing a lot of weight, go easy on the exercise because it's going to stress you out. Uh, mm -hmm. if you're at a calorie deficit and your body's going to retain water. So that's why I tell people, if you really want to lose weight, just relax for a while and gradually add in exercise as you get close to your goal weight. Uh, I would definitely make sure if you're going to eat one meal a day and you, you're going to exercise, on a raw vegan diet, you're going to have to make sure you get a lot of cal. You're going to have to make sure you get those calories because otherwise you may develop a deficiency. I would also supplement. So what about nuts and seeds? Like would they even more co cause even more constipation or would they be good on that? In no, that they, would, case? they would probably help a little. Okay. Um, Remember, you don't want to go heavy on the, on the oils or nuts or nut butters because those are fats. And when you're combining fats and proteins, mm -hmm. you will, you, it, it's harder on your body. That's true, so, even if it's. So we can take whole nuts and see it's not nut butters, right? Like, yes. Get away because you're getting, yeah, the nut butters are really tough. Uh, plus yeah. you're getting a lot of fat. So if you eat a lot of fruit and then you eat peanut butter or something, no, that's mm -hmm. not that. That's a really inefficient way of eating, I think. But you might try it you, uh, and uh, see, it'll, it'll, it will give you the calories. <laughs> you, you could definitely get the calories that way. And what about 
लाइक आई हैव अ रूटीन दैट आई फॉलो आई आई ड्रिंक जूस इन द मॉर्निंग एंड देन आफ्टर टू आवर्स ओनली आई हैव माय फ्रूट्स और ब्रेकफास्ट सो इन द ओम एट सिंस वी हैव ओनली वन आवर ईटिंग विंडो तो सो वट वट कैन वी डू लाइक इन दैट वन आवर ओनली if we take juices also and fruits also and like smoothie and vegetable also so would the juice be effective like would it have the same effect that it has on an empty stomach after and before we take the juice so you're saying you have a juice and then you wait a while and then have the meal yes yes okay so what you're actually describing isn't really a a type of omad thing I'm not saying you can't do it and try it out but most mm-hmm. people they do omad they do this they find me generally because they have some sort of addiction whether it be usually food but some mm-hmm. other addiction where they're having trouble because they're becoming too much of a foodie you sound like you're in control you just want a way to optimize so it doesn't mm-hmm. sound like you really need omad it sounds like you just kind of want to do it within a, a general fasting with If that's the case, when you get up, have your juice, and then close the window after your meal, you know, four or five hours. Mm-hmm. That's what I would offer you because it it does. It sounds like your real interest is in your your program, your the foods. It's really hard to do OMAD for. I've had people that came up and 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 told me they were professional athletes and can I can they get enough food in one meal to to power them? And my answer is I don't know. You're going to have to eat a lot. if you're a super vigorous athlete. So it's mm-hmm. the same situation here. Your food is such that it may not be best served with one meal a day. It may be easier yeah, to just You said exactly my point because I uh, often I I think in that week's time I uh, it did a very less and that's why I would have suffered because I was not able to include many calories in that meal. i was just doing it for uh, you know mental clarity purposes and things like that right no i understand and which i got also which i got also and i felt very uh, you know good in that in those 23 hours of fasting but eventually on the eighth day i had to like struggle very much in the you know washroom oh okay so, so yeah I and i also i thought uh, i i'm never going to attempt omad again Well, I understand okay. you're you're going to I would what I would do if I were you is I would open a feeding window in the AM when you can drink your juice and then just stay in that and don't eat outside of that. I think it would be best for you from from what you're telling. Okay. Good. And you, one more question one more question I had was uh like uh, uh, generally we know that uh, vegan junk food or uh, anyways the fried food and stuff like that uh clog the colon and uh, you know they to- uh, fill up toxins in the body so if yeah. we if someone like not me i'm not talking about me i'm mean, talking in general if someone says that i'm going to do omad from tomorrow but i'll be including those uh, you know toxic foods in my diet in that one hour only so what do you think would they be that harmful only in in his body when he's fasting for 23 hours after eating that stuff or not you you're asking it would it be if he's fasting with vegan junk food yes yes no yeah i would i don't recommend any of that uh you want fruits or you want meats or my best foods or starches um uh, uh moderating the starches and, and uh and i don't whole foods like right Yes, that whole, food, whole foods, whole foods, not vegan, but whole foods, like whole the good stuff. So, if a person does want to stay with the vegan and do that, if they can make it work for them and supplement and make sure they don't become deficient, then that's great. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, I, yeah, I would anyone who's doing that that sort of thing uh, mm-hmm. is with the vegan junk food is asking for trouble. And so I tell people, you can do it like any sort of junk food. Occasionally, you can have it, but don't rely on. that means you occasionally we can have but uh, the whole diet should not be like that only yeah, right right yeah you, anybody can have anything sometimes you can drink okay. poisons oh. uh, now okay. 
a little bit cheeky, but uh, you know, you, you, the issue is you don't depend on that. And most people, when they start bringing in the nuts and nut butters and all of this crazy stuff, they start depending on that. And then they don't realize mm-hmm. they're eating a whole lot of fat, a whole lot of calories. And then they, they lose their perspective and they start just eating junk. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Have a great Okay, guys, do you have any more questions for Joe? Okay, Joe, I wanted to ask you, um, because you have lots of experience working with people, uh, about people who have eating disorders such as anorexia, bulimia, and other things. So how would you go about those people in terms of OMAD? Would you still recommend it? Um. Yes and no. Uh, when I when I do get someone, and I do frequently, they get they come to me and they tell me, you know, I'm I had a guy, he 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 got on webcam. He was probably 90 pounds. He was six foot. So he and he he started to tell me, and I said, look, this isn't this isn't for you. Uh, so as far as eating disorders, uh, usually that's a we we try. I, I have a graph. I have an assessment I do with people, and uh, which I, I'll offer to everybody here if if they decide they want to go and uh, get, you know, uh, buy a consult with me and go further than that. Uh, But we talk about underlying problems. We learn about their motivations, their worldview. It is super detailed. Uh, And basically they learn a lot about themselves. When we do work with those sorts of image disorders, then there's usually a reason behind it. So OMAD can work, but they have to realize, they have to address the source of the problem. Um, It's, it's, you know, with alcoholics, they have to stop drinking. Uh, with uh, any sort of issue, it's it's either selfishness or some self worth issue that comes into play, and that's why it's so very important to. So underweight is a different question. I would say no. You know, it, it, you know, there are a few people out there who can eat all day and not gain weight. You know, bless them because there's not most of us aren't like that, right? Uh, but the big big thing is to make sure that your body image you do not have body image issues, and that's probably. Since I do need to run along here pretty soon, I do need to uh, stress that, listen, this is not about body image issues. So if you're one of those who look in the mirror, folks, and you don't like what you see, you have to understand nothing. You never arrive. Your body will always look that way to you to to most to the biggest extent. Um, Everything will just only, you know, as they say, only the names will change. Uh, You know, things are the same. Only the names will change. You have to remember there's something up here that says it is never good enough. So you can't have that. You have to understand when you lose your weight, you'll have all the other problems. You'll have all the other struggles that you've ever had. Uh, You can't use that as a means to overcome or compensate. And that's why I tell people losing weight is a big deal, but it's not ultimately what you need to lose is your lack of self-worth. And you need to understand that, uh, that if this well runs way deeper than you could possibly know. So that's why a lot of my consulting ends up very little about weight loss. It ends up about the fact that somebody had a tragedy in their earlier in their life. And I didn't ask for it. I've kind of always been a minister, but uh, which I was, I professionally was for a number of years before going back a ways. But um, I always keep doing that because what I find is that people are not okay with who they are. That's where the eating disorders come from. And if that's you, that's a whole nother program. I have another program for that. But uh, the issue wouldn't be OMAD. It would just be them, their mind. Everything is the mind, right? That's what we're coming back to. Right, right, right. Okay, Joe. So I have just one last question, and then we'll talk a little bit about the services that you are providing, and then we will wrap it up for today. And um, hopefully we might meet another time in the future as well. Uh, So um, we have lots of people from India here. And uh, in India, I know the cases of diabetes is pretty prevalent so and also not not just in india but all over so uh from your experience working with diabetics uh, type 1 type 2 um and omads what can you tell in this realm here's what i can tell about any health condition um your health condition is like a supervillain. you have uh, let's say uh, optimus prime and megatron on the transformers every episode it's about Megatron retreating and he says next time Optimus Prime and in the next episode he's fighting there again you have to look at your health problems in the same way you will never get rid of your health problems you can treat them but they're still a part of you 
um, the same way a standard transmission, for, for, there may be people here too young to remember, but back in the days when we had to learn to drive a standard manual transmission, when you get on a hill, if you don't quickly put your foot on the brake and the gas and then heel and toe it to where you can get the, it to accelerate, you will hit the car behind you. It's like that with all of your health problems. Your, there's a, the fact that you are who you are means that you will have self, you will have health problems. I have none right now. Perfect health. Don't wear glasses. I don't take ED meds. I don't take Viagra. I don't do any of that. Nothing. But I do have the potential when I'm older to contract leukemia because there's some blood markers that we have to watch. That's me. Same thing with you, especially if you're Indian and, and it is an epidemic, like 85% nearly of, uh, of Indian and Hindu people have struggled with diabetes. You have to learn to control it. And that means very often you won't be able to stay to your vegetarian grain diet. I'm telling you that uh, a lot of you people, you're not gonna be able to do it. So the, the big challenge there will be accepting yourself. And this gets back to image as well. Uh, you will always have your health problems, so what you have to do is work around them. Yes, they'll retreat for a while. Usually, diabetes and uh, fasting will get rid of diabetes in most cases. It depends on the person. Uh, I talk to people all the time who had who were on insulin, and they came off their own no insulin. But it doesn't mean that that can never happen again. So let's be realistic. You are beautiful and perfect the way you are. I said that applies to everything in a minute. Everybody has the potential for disease. Uh, the same way the earth, as perfect as it is for us, has the potential for getting wiped out by an asteroid or getting cooked by the sun or being you know, baked by a solar flare. It's possible and can happen. What you do is you say, here's what I've got. Here's what I can work with. So as far as, I don't want to convey false hope. And that's what so many people who do self-improvement do. You will always struggle with your medical conditions, but you can manage them. And in the process, they are your teachers. They teach you the lesson because without the dukkha, nothing makes sense. Without the imperfection, you can't understand perfection. And this is why for all of our progress today, we still love superhero movies. We still love to create role models and all because that's us visualizing perfection. But you can't visualize perfection unless you yourself are imperfect. So that's why with all of the perfect imperfections of our world, we're still perfect. So your health problems, you don't let them get you down. You don't get sidetracked and think, oh, who cares? You keep going. You understand that many, much diabetes can be treated very well. About 80% of it will go away. 85% of it will go away with just diet. Uh, there are a few cases it won't. And uh, it's no different than Iron Man and that synthetic heart, you know, that, that special device he has to wear. It's no different. Uh, you can still contribute in the same ways. And I tell people all the time, do not lose your self-worth because of your health conditions. It does not pay. Wow. Thank you so much. Okay, guys. So before we wrap it up, you have the, your last chance to ask Joe the questions you want. Does anyone have any more questions? Okay, Joe, so um, please tell us a little bit about your services, about your coaching services. What kind of people do you work with and uh, like what, what's, what is your objective while coaching people, etc.? Well, I've always said from the start, OMAD is always free. Um, I, since I put it on the internet in 2015 and everybody copied it, uh, I've always, I've never charged for anything except the only thing I charge for are my consulting services because that's my time. Uh, I have, I charge around $90 US for uh, an a hour of, maybe hour and a half I'll give you, um, for just asking me questions and we talk about various issues. Uh, whatever you want to talk about, it's your time. And then I have a more expensive program around $300 US, which is a, uh, a graph and it's called the Big Five Assessment. Uh, I work with behavioral resource group. So part of that is personality profiles and includes a disc graph, it includes all, it includes uh, the Hartman graph, the values graph. We look at your biases. We look at your subconscious. We, it, it'll basically take the, the graph, the assessment, if you want it. I'll give it to you. It'll take about an hour to complete. And then when you get it done, we'll schedule a time and we'll take about four to five hours to go over the assessment and plus any of the other things that you would ask in the, 
you know, just asking me questions. Uh, it is pretty intense, so it takes a while. Uh, it is very detailed, and you will learn more about yourself than you've ever known, I promise. I've never had someone, never have I had to refund someone from uh, uh, any of the, in, from my, cons my advanced consulting program, I call it. Uh, so if you do want that, please reach out. And you will, we will, we will take the time together and, and do more than that. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much what I do. Those two uh, around my corporate career in hotels here in, in the Houston area, I manage it. I managed to uh, stay busy. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Joe, and uh, what kind of people do you think your services are more, are the most suited for? Like what kind of conditions do you expect people to contact you, et cetera? My services are generally for people who are uh, self-betterers, people who are looking, a lot, a lot of my clients are doctors, lawyers, secretaries, housewives. It varies, but they're all looking for clarification. They're all looking to know themselves, which turns out is the hardest thing of all, right? Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, uh, it's pretty wide, but I've gotten uh, business executives, uh, some of whom I could name, I've talked with, worked with, uh, I uh, and other people that you wouldn't know. Um, but um, all all the results are obviously confidential, and I take great pride in what I offer. Um, but basically, anyone who wants clarification, who wants to understand themselves, or maybe you're in a situation where I've had this too. I've had people come out of the woodwork who were lost and having trouble in, in their relationships and decided that they wanted to talk with someone. And so while I'm, I, I can't, there's a lot of areas I can't speak in, I can definitely shed some light on that. And very seldom does any of that involve food. Mm -hmm. nope. but, uh, but does it have to be connected to OMAD? Like uh, does the person have to have this intention of going OMAD or not necessarily? Not at all. It's, it's I relate it to that because it helps me figure out What's driving people? What makes them tick? And sometimes we can undercover some blocks or the reasons they're falling off, reasons they're craving, reasons they're having struggles. Uh, but that's all. It's not related anymore anymore to that. Mm, I see. I see. Okay, Joe. So thank you very much for this wonderful interview, for this wonderful webinar. We are going to put your contact details below this video. So lots of people will be exposed to that. And uh, hopefully we can see each other again in the future, maybe cover some other subjects. But uh, yeah, yeah, I really, really enjoyed just what just uh, really just I want to let you know that it was really, really my pleasure and honor to have you here. Really. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I didn't disappoint anybody, but uh, definitely. Yeah. Reach out joeholmanonline.com if anybody does need help. And uh, thank you. Uh, let's be in touch. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely, Joe. So have a blessed day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.